During this lesson, you will need a Linux server and a Linux client. Before continuing, you should make sure that both of these hosts are configured to use an internal interface within VirtualBox. Start the Linux client and if needed, log in. This version has a graphical user interface, but also supports all of the commands that we have used so far within the terminal. To start the terminal, we can right click on the desktop, then on Open Terminal. The first course of action is to check the adapter names by using the following command. In our example they appear as EMP0S3 and LO. Now to check the configuration of these adapters. As in the previous task, the network adapters EMP0S3 does not have an IPv4 address. Next, we shall make a backup of the interfaces file in case we meet with any problems. As we have mentioned in the start of this task, the directory structure is the same as with the Linux server, so we can use the same command previously used. Check that it has been successfully been copied, listing the directory. Now to edit the interfaces file. This time the adapter EMP0S3 does not appear. And here we shall also find two new commands called IF up and IF down. We shall return to these shortly. As before we shall add the following scripts to this file. To save the file and exit, hold down the control key and press the X key. Type in yes to save, then enter to leave the name of the file the same. Recheck the configuration of the adapters. We should have found that there has been no change in the configuration. We could restart this client, but Linux has included a command to allow us to make the changes we have made to take effect immediately. To restart the network adapters, we can use the following command. Notice how we have specified the interface name EMP0S3. This basically means to run the interface configuration file. However, if we wanted to disable the EMP0S3 adapter, then we could have used the alternative command. Checking the configuration again, and we should have found that the IP address of 10.20.30.40 should have taken effect. We can think of the Linux being the core operating system on top of this, it's the GUI, such as GNOME or KDE. So the commands that we have been using at the terminal level are compatible with almost all distributions. Now to configure the Linux server. The Linux server, as with most servers, can support more than one network. So each network would be supported by additional network adapters. These networks can be completely separate. So the users or clients from one network may or may not have permission to send data from one network to another. We did mention in previous tasks that the Linux server had to be restarted for the new IP address to take effect. If this was entirely true, and if the server supported multiple networks, then when the server was restarted that anyone connected to any of the networks would lose connectivity. This could cause disaster, especially if the user was saving files, or a particularly large file was being processed to a printer. Linux supports an on-the-fly process, so an IP address can be applied without restarting the server. First we will check the configuration of the existing adapters. You can see here that we already have an IP address of 192.168.1.1. Now we shall apply a temporary address. Checking the IP address, we can see this has taken effect. The IP address will only be affected while the server is on. If it is rebooted, then the IP address that appears in the interfaces file will be adopted. We can see this if we reboot now. We should have found that the IP address that appears in the interface file has taken effect again. Next we shall give the Linux server a new permanent IP address and a suitable netmask.
using the ping command, we can test for connectivity. The ping command varies slightly from the one that we have used in the Microsoft Windows, in that it continues to send packets to the host until it is instructed to stop. And this can be done by holding down the control key, then pressing the C key. 